All right, let's pause for a minute and go back and take a look at kind of the historic evolution of these ideas because they're really quite interesting and they give some insight into some of the thinking behind spina bifida over the years. If one looks back to old surgery tech textbooks, it's quite interesting because many of the basic fundamental concepts which involve rolling tissue to the midline and sequentially closing in layers were, were actually introduced long before and known long before there was widespread closure of myelomeningocele's. In centuries past and in even decades past, only a small portion of children born with open myelomeningocele underwent any attempt at placement, despite the fact that these older textbooks, this one from the early 1900s by Fraser, shows very similar techniques to what we even use today. So it was not an issue that there was no surgery, there was no concept of surgically how to do this. It was a ethical and uh, cultural approach. These children were considered untreatable. These children were considered to have uniform mortality. These children were considered to be, you know, untouchable basically. And part of that pertains to the fact that we didn't have shunts to treat their associated hydrocephalus, nor an understanding of their kidneys, so that even if, they're, even if they were treated, that many of them did, had a, a shortened course um, of lots of complications. If you look early, the first really organized series talking about cl um, uh, closure of myelomeningocele's wasn't until 1943, so almost half of the 20th century had gone by before there was an organized series published about closure of myelomeningocele. And if you look, it's absolutely stunning. These children weren't even considered for closure until they were over a year of age. They were typically more until 18 months of age in the classic by Ingraham. And for those of you that are pupils of the history of pediatric neurosurgery, you'll know that Ingraham was one of the uh, very first North American pediatric neurosurgeons, an absolute monumental character at the Boston Children's Hospitals, one of the early leaders and one of the sort of grandfathers of pediatric neurosurgery. And this classic paper from 1943 showed that they didn't even consider kids for closure until they were about 18 months of age. And that allowed assessment of the neurologic status. And then they would only close if the neuro status wasn't severe and the IQ was normal. Now, how they ascertained that, I really don't know, but it fundamentally uh, shows sort of the conceptual approach was, which was by and large nihilistic and don't touch. Okay, so then the wheel of time turns a little bit. And so now Lorber in the 60s was a pediatrician who did fr from the UK, who did studies on outcomes in patients with spina bifida and published some very, very controversial um, uh, papers. His approach was basically that these, these patients, these children were, want to quote him, a burden to themselves, their family, and to society. And he, he embraced and articulated a very uh, nihilistic and in today's world, very pessimistic uh, view of what could be done to help these patients that harbored neural tube defects. It was a rather stunning um, paper. It was, and it had very significant impact and pushed the whole field toward nihilism. And it wasn't until the 1980s when Dr. McClone really came on the scene and made, um, big, uh, made a big presence for himself and his center, challenging these, saying this is nonsense, that very satisfactory outcomes with good quality of life can be attained, but that it requires diligent care across the lifespan. And McClone is a guy who we would all do well to emulate. He was a neurosurgeon who practiced in Chicago. At that time, it was called Children's Memorial Hospital, and it's evolved into Lurie Children's Hospital. And Robin Bowman, who spoke to you at one of your previous webinars, is the director of the Spina Bifida Clinic there, and she's a direct sort of inheritant of Dr. McClone's practice. Well, McClone was a giant. He was both a scientist and a surgeon. And he was fundamentally dedicated to the notion that even the people with the greatest disability in our society have absolutely the same rights, absolutely the same needs um, as the rest of us. And um, that it is fundamentally not only ethically unjustifiable, but it's medically not right to simply 
stand back when there are things that can be done. So what did he do? He created a center at Children's Memorial in Chicago, and that was the place to go to learn how to treat children with spina bifida for the longest time. His fellowship was two years in duration in pediatric neurosurgery. One year was spent doing research about spina bifida. One year was spent doing clinical neurosurgery. And as a result, they published hundreds of papers um, on this, uh, on which uh, set, the, set the bar to this day. So why so much detail on Dr. McClone? He's an example. He's an example of what you can do, of what you can be. You find a problem that interests you. You find a problem that you engage. You use everything within your capacity to fix it, to, to throw everything you've got at it. David McClone was an MD, PhD who ran labs, and he had a very uh, vigorous training program. And the world is fundamentally, certainly the world of spina bifida is fundamentally different. So on we go, 1970s multi-layered closure, widespread improvement because of shunts. Shunts are silastic. Silastic is, is a rubberized silicone, which is a direct development of the polymer chemistry that came about in World War II. And as a result, that allowed things to move forward in the 60s. Most of you have probably heard the tale of the development of the shunt. Uh, uh, an engineer uh, an engineer, I believe it was uh, at, at Stanford or Hewlett Packard or in that area, uh, was who had a child with spina bifida was told, I'm sorry, there's nothing you, we can do. And in fact, because there's no tube that won't clot. And he said, yeah, there is, I can solve it myself. And that led to the development of shunts. So with shunts came the capacity to treat hydrocephalus in the 70s. And the, the longevity improved. Right around the same time, we began to understand how to care for the bladder. We began to understand all the, uh, the, the patients died of hydrocephalus and the patients died of hydronephrosis. And both of these were critically important. Through the 80s and through the 90s, many controversies about subcomponents of clinical neurosurgery pertaining to the spina bifida. Whether or not Chiari 2 is a disease of hydrocephalus manifestation, or is it a disease of space constraint like Chiari 1? Should they be surgically decompressed? Or is the right step, in fact, to take is it to assure a functioning shunt? Much, much controversy about that. And the groundwork was beginning to be laid in the 90s for the intrauterine uh, closure. And this, is a, this was actually an area where pediatric neurosurgery and neurosurgery in general is to be congratulated because there were a number of different centers that were doing preliminary work in intrauterine closure, and they all agreed to halt their own interests in the better interests of science. And they declared a moratorium in the treatment of in utero closure of myelomeningocele. And they enabled, this enabled moms to move forward, which is to say moms, which we'll talk about a little bit more, was a prospective randomized clinical trial that, that evaluated the impact of intrauterine closure. And it was predicated on much of the early preliminary work done a lot of it at UCSF and Diana Farmer's lab about with using sheet models and things of this nature, as well as at CHOP and, and ADZIC's lab, using models that showed that intrauterine closure uh, arrested and uh, reduced many of the very important comorbidities of spina bifida. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.